Development at Australia Embassy. Um, Mr. James Dean is the second secretary development at the Australia Embassy, where he manages a portfolio of programs focused on climate change adaptation, Mekong development, and water resources management. Um, in his 10-year career um, with Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, James has lived and worked in Vietnam, Philippines, and Tonga. In Canberra, he has worked as a policy officer supporting Australia's relationship with ASEAN and Pakistan. So, well <laughs> well, thank you very much and, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we might run through uh, my prepared remarks and then happy to take any questions that you want. Uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity to join you here today to talk about uh, global citizenship education. Education is more important now than it ever was. The COVID-19 pandemic has not just disrupted lives and livelihoods, it's also disrupted the way that we study and learn. It's changed the skills that people need to participate in the workforce, and it has accelerated the way we work together to solve big problems. As we've seen, the world is more interconnected than ever before, whether it's through travel, global supply chains, or the flow of capital and ideas. The challenges of our time, uh, like climate change and future pandemics, will only be solved through smart people collaborating across borders and leveraging our collective potential. If the goal of global citizenship education is a more just, peaceful, tolerant, inclusive, secure, and sustainable world, then it shares many of the objectives of diplomatic networks around the world. As Australia's Foreign Minister Penny Wong recently said at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in Singapore, it is up to all of us to create the kind of region we aspire to, a peaceful, stable, prosperous, and secure region. That is why education is such a large element of Australia's diplomatic engagement in the region. We are helping build the networks and the skills of the next generation of leaders to be active global citizens. Uh, here in Vietnam, the education relationship is deep, broad and growing. It's underpinned by strong people to people, government to government and institution to institution links. In 2021, Australia and Vietnam finalised the Enhanced Economic Engagement Strategy to further the strategic partnerships between the two countries. The strategy commits Australia and Vietnam to become top 10 trading partners and double two-way investment. The Triple EES, as it's known, and its implementation plan also recognises the value of both countries' enduring relationship between our higher education institutions. Under the Triple EES, Australia and Vietnam committed to increasing exchange of students and staff and collaboration in research and innovation, including to support Vietnam's university governance reform agenda. We committed to supporting the Australia Vietnam Centre to bring together influential leaders to pursue policy solutions to shared regional challenges with a heightened focus on advancing women in leadership. We committed to support Vietnam's capacity building in higher education through the $45 million Oz for Skills program for the period 2021 to 2025. This includes the prestigious Australia Award Scholarship Program. Since 1974, Australia has funded more than 6,000 Australian Award Scholarships supporting Vietnamese leaders and emerging leaders to undertake study, research and professional development in Australia. I recently had the good fortune to chair an Australia Award selection panel for the 2023 intake of scholarship applicants seeking to under undertake their master's degree in Australia. It is striking that the selection criteria used to select the successful candidates reflect the cognitive, socio-emotional -emo and behavioural conceptual dimensions of global citizenship. Most applicants we interviewed were able to clearly articulate the cognitive value of their proposed study and its relevance to, to Vietnam's development priorities. The best candidates were able to articulate the interconnectedness of their field to specific knowledge and experience in Australia. However, what really stood out to the panel were the applicants capable of describing their behavioural characteristics and socio-emotional motivations. The panel was eager to find individuals with the passion and the drive to not only take full opportunity of the content of their course, but to immerse themselves in the experience of cross-cultural cross study. The most exceptional candidates had a plan for how they would maintain their professional networks and actively collaborate long after they returned to Vietnam with their new qualifications and experiences. These scholarships recipients will join a network of over 70,000 Australian alumni living, living in Vietnam who work across a wide range of professions and contribute to Vietnam's success in a number of different fields. 
The opportunity to live and study overseas is, of course, critical to the development to a, of a sense of global citizenship. Australia remains a preferred destination for, for Vietnamese students. Between January and May this year, over 17,000 Vietnamese students were studying in Australia. We look forward to seeing this number continue to climb back towards the pre-pandemic levels of almost 26,000 students in 2019. Vietnam is of growing interest to Australian students, with over 1,000 students undertaking study, internships and mentorships in, 2020, in 2019 under the New Colombo Plan. I myself was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to live, work and volunteer internationally during my own studies. I know firsthand how these experiences equip you with the skills and experiences required to make a contribution to tackle, the, to tackle substantial global issues. As an undergraduate at the University of Wollongong in Australia, I undertook an internship and later a paid position in the office of James Clyburn, the majority whip in the United States Congress. In this predominantly black office, I learned about the machinations of the American political system, but also heard first-hand accounts from Mr. Clyburn and the late John Lewis uh, of seminal moments in the American civil rights movement. Shortly after that experience, I volunteered in a rural village outside of Bangalore in India. And I lived in a shipping container for around six weeks and worked with children of the victims of domestic violence. Before commencing my honours year, I spent a year in the Bologna campus of the John, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Italy, with students from over 25 countries studying international conflict re resolution. I remember le learning from and with students from Sierra Leone, Rwanda and Cyprus, who had first-hand experience of co post-conflict situations. Throughout my undergraduate, I also worked with the Australian Indigenous Mentoring Experience, the program brought Indigenous Australian high school students onto university campuses to encourage the transition into tertiary education. Equally, it was an opportunity for people like me, non-Indigenous university students, to learn more about Indigenous culture, the oldest living culture in the world. Each of these experiences contributed to a greater understanding of my capacity to work collaborative, collaboratively to achieve shared goals through many of the skills being discussed during this conference intercultural understanding, resiliency and adapta adaptability, inclusivity, the ability to immerse oneself in cross-cultural experiences, all are skills that can be learned in a lecture theatre, and all are skills that are critical to a career in diplomacy. Since joining the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, I've enjoyed opportunities to complete a posting in Tonga, a short-term mission to Turkey, Pakistan and the Philippines, and now I live and work here in Vietnam. I've worked on infrastructure programs, labour mobility agreements, trade agreements, human rights dialogues, intercultural exchanges, climate change policy, disaster response and health security. Through valuing and seeking out opportunities to learn and develop my own global citizenship perspective, I've been able to improve, improve my ability to contribute to large, complex and politically sensitive endeavours. A global citizenship perspective is critical to ensure this immensely complex, intangible and often excruciatingly incremental work continues to deliver for diverse and often disempowered communities. As the Embassy uh, here prepares to mark our 50th year of diplomatic relations with Vietnam next year, we are taking stock of the opportunities to work together to achieve the country, the region and the globe that we want to live in. There are no shortages of, of challenges. Climate change is the single greatest threat to livelihood, security and well-being of the peoples of the Pacific and an urgent global challenge. Here in Vietnam, a three degree temperature increase would see the inundation of up to 50% of the Mekong Delta, impacting the 17 million people who live there and up to 50% of Vietnam's rice production. We only have to look at the war in Ukraine to see how instability has exacerbated global hunger, disrupted food exports, increased energy prices, raised fertiliser costs and cause, cause global food prices to spike. The war in Ukraine is also an example of the need for all countries to uphold the rules and norms that have underpinned our growth and stability. But where there are challenges, there are also opportunities. Vietnam is eager to continue on its path of rapid economic growth, becoming a high income country by 2045. To do so, it will need to continue on its path of economic integration in the region and seize on the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution and economic digitalization. Increased availability of climate change finance and rapid growth in green technologies will bring about other opportunities for improved transboundary haze management 
and uh, will have flow-on health benefits to the region. These are some of the challenges and opportunities that the next generation of global leaders will be taking on. That is why it is so critical that the discussions today have brought together so many stakeholders to consider ways to strengthen the education foundations for our future leaders. Australia will remain a key supporter of education as an enabler for shaping the stable, peaceful, prosperous and secure region that we all want to live, on, uh, live in. I wish you all good health, happiness and a successful conference. You can come on and uh, happy to take any questions. So thank you so much for such an inspiring So thank you so much for such an inspiring speech from you. So I guess that um, you know, all the audiences here must have some questions to ask uh, to give you. So is this your time to you know, answer them, please? Of course. And uh, now that we're through with the formal part, this can be a much more free-flowing discussion. And um, I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have about the embassy, about Australia. Um, about my, my own experience, uh, the floor is, is open for any questions. Where were you during the pandemic? Uh, so for the pandemic, I was in Canberra, um, which was quite a lucky place uh, to be. We, we, um, we enjoyed a pretty comfortable lifestyle. Um, professionally, it was quite an interesting uh, time. I was working on the ASEAN desk um, so working with the 10 ASEAN member countries um, and halfway through the pandemic I was given responsibility for um, establishing a new ASEAN public health centre um, which uh, I, I sort of touched on a little bit in the, the presentation. I, I don't have a health background uh, whatsoever but you know some of those skills of being able to move between different subjects and different topics and different cultures um, it really gives you the confidence to be able to pick up a topic run with it, learn very quickly what you need to know about it, and then uh, try to make something happen. So that was, that was a, a, my experience of the pandemic. It was quite an um, unusual one. Um, I think you know, one of the things that I, that I really love that has happened um, during the pandemic, and I'm sure it hasn't just happened at the embassy, it's happened all across the world, is uh, a recognition that people are not uh, you know, just workers. You know, they have a life. Uh, that they live when they're not at work or they're not at university. Um, I think it sort of, you know, came to came to the fore through some of those really funny videos of people's children running into the back of um, uh, of meetings and and those sort of um, things that happened. But it, it really had a, a flow-on effect to the way that we work. Um, so we, we were able to work remotely um, with a much more flexible sort of control over our. Uh, the, the, the style of work that we were doing and the times that we were working to enable us to balance our responsibilities to our friends, families, other networks um, with our work duties. And I think a lot of that really good um, sort of adaptability, uh, adaptation that happened has been retained even as we sort of move back into the office now. Um, so I think, I think that was one. I think... Um, uh, possibly a second one was uh, a much much greater willingness of people to um, step outside of their defined roles to fill gaps. I mean, as people sort of became, um, you know, came down with COVID-19 and were forced to be out of the office or had um, children or, or loved ones that were, that were sick, um, there was a much greater willingness for people to sort of take on extra duties and, and really see themselves as part of a community trying to achieve a goal. Um, rather than the sort of the more rigid uh, work units that we're, we're used to dealing in. Hmm. Um, I think there's been, there's been a lot. I, you know, uh, one of the things that takes a lot of getting used to when you start in this line of work is it's really an office-based job. Uh, it's, a, it's a very bureaucratic job. You're pushing papers around on your desk. <laughs> Uh, a lot of the time, but the the opportunities that we really relish are when we get to get out of the office and go and visit the communities that we that we uh, support and that we work with. Um, I'm really fortunate. My area of responsibility is the Mekong Delta, um, which is an enormous part of Vietnam. Um, really dynamic, really engaging, and vibrant. Um, and I've had the opportunity to visit it on a number of occasions. Um, but I think, you know, there are, there are times when you walk into a school where we've installed, you know, um, a water purification system or, um, you know, uh, we, we've, we've worked with um, uh, 
you know, the scholarships recipients, people that you, you're really actually making quite a tangible um, difference to their life. I think those are the moments that, that stick with you. Um, and they're the moments that give you the motivation to continue when you're working at a very intangible level on policy reform, on um, you know, analysis, where you, you, the actual day-to-day -day gains are very, very minimal, but very significant. Um, it's, it's those moments when you get out of the office and interact with the community that get you through. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a lot of good, uh, there's a lot of ways that you can be involved. Um, often we don't uh, work individually with, with small projects. A lot of our projects are sort of um, quite large in scale, quite large in dollar values, and they work through established NGOs or with government partners. Um, so I would, I would say, you know, and it, it doesn't have to be the Australian Embassy. I think uh, if you're interested in a, an area uh, or a topic in Vietnam and you want to work on it, Find, reach out to one of the organisations that has an ongoing project and see if you can volunteer or if you can, uh, you know, find a job with those, with those people. Um, there, there really is such a sense of goodwill in the development community that often there are lots of opportunities to get out and, and to intern, gain that experience. Um, and, yeah, I would say a lot of the time it actually leads to a sort of a career that you may not have anticipated or further opportunities. Um, in my own experience, Putting my hand up for the first internship led to the second, which led to the third, and they keep building um, until you get to a place that you can't, couldn't have even envisioned uh, when you when you set out on the process. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Lin, for the question. Um, just before I came here, I was reading the uh, VCCI Fulbright um, economic study on the Mekong Delta. Um, I know we're, we're launching the second one uh, next week, um, and the Consul General from um, Ho Chi Minh City, the Australian, yeah, Sarah Hooper, will be attending, um, and we've, we, we're, we're very, very happy to have sponsored um, part of the, the launch of that report. So I know, I know that aspect of your work very well, um, I also know we did a, a study recently on digital transformation um, for governance um, through the UNDP project, um, uh, PUPI. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we're keen to develop the relationship that we have with lots of different um, institutions in, in Vietnam that are doing exciting research that can help us better target interventions. So um, let's, let's continue that great work. Yep. We have a question from the students. So last year, during the pandemic, I have joined a mentorship program from Study Network. Do you know Study Network? I'm not familiar with it. Oh, yeah, but yeah, it's a program from Victoria Station to like connect the Australian students with the, um, the international students like us in yeah. Vietnam because uh, at, at that time uh, international students uh, they like they, they come back home in Vietnam so uh, they want to make a bridge between Australia and Vietnam and I think it's a really great uh, connection for us to like to to to, to like have some conversation to, uh, about the cultural experience and also like make friends. Mm -hmm. And however, until now, I I didn't see any uh, further program like that mm -hmm. because uh, I think that it's just a program during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. However, I think after the, the pandemic, I think that somehow the program like that can keep the connection for us to connect to each other. Yeah. 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 I've just got myself in. No, that's terrific. Um, letting them know I'm putting some pressure to get them to come to Hanoi. So, 
Yeah, that's terrific. And I, I, as I said, I'm not familiar with that specific program, but uh, you t just in general, I think that mentoring programs are um, phenomenally important. Um, and I think, you know, uh, what I can do is take that message back to the embassy and talk to our education counselor and, you know, say, we, we, we had this great program during the pandemic. There's still an appetite for it. We should continue um, and look for opportunities to do similar things. Um, I know there's there's lots of exciting things happening in Australia, um, particularly in regards to Vietnam. Vietnam is such an important country for us. Um, there's a lot of thinking about how we can improve Australia's uh, Vietnam literacy, including uh, through language and through cultural exchange. Um, so options like this, um, where we already have such a strong foundation of institutions, Australian educational institutions working in, in Vietnam, um, would be a really good opportunity to sort of to build on those foundations and improve the the two-way.